Good morning. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I sound loud up here. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. I was uh, just here a couple weeks ago, and it's great to be back today. Wendell and Pastor Jackson, I think, are in uh, Austin. Am I right? Austin? Uh, at a conference. So beware. They'll come back charged up. I can tell you. So uh, that's great. I'm glad you're able to go and do that, and I thank you for the opportunity to come and and uh, fill in for Pastor Jackson this morning and spend uh, some time in God's Word sharing with you. Uh, really enjoyed the songs, Carl, and the praise team. Uh, you guys kind of got into that days of Elijah, didn't you? Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. That was great. Well, when I was here two weeks ago, we uh, looked at the book of Job. And uh, I'm going to continue kind of with that theme this morning uh, from, from a different perspective. Last time we talked about, we looked at the first three chapters of Job's and selected verses, and, and we talked about our role as comforters. And uh, we talked about that verse that uh, God says uh, that we are to comfort uh, one another. And we talked about Job's three friends who came to comfort him and some things they did right and some things they did wrong. But uh, when we look at that age-old question still asked today, why does God permit suffering? If God is a God of love, how can he let people suffer? If God is a God of love, how can he let that earthquake happen that happened a few weeks ago? Thousands of people died as a result of that. And, and we looked at what I said was for predominant reasons that you and I have our seasons of suffering. And uh, one reason in, in the book of Job, uh, suffering that is inflicted by the evil and by the devil. And that was Job's cause of his suffering. And we, we learned that the devil was out to steal, to kill, and destroy from, in Scripture. And uh, But we did find out something positive, and that was the devil is not allowed to come against you without God's permission if you are one of his children. God limits what the devil can do. But uh, he still allows him at times to inflict suffering on his children. Second thing we talked about, suffering is brought on by our own choices. The biblical principle, we reap what we sow, so there are consequences to our choices. Another reason we suffer in this world is because we live in a fallen sinful world and the bible says it rains on the just and the unjust and it's just part of life and lastly there are times that god will send what he calls what scripture calls these fiery trials into our lives that he might make us more like jesus and that's what we're going to talk about today is is those fiery trials and why God sends them. And we can title this message this morning, uh, Go for the Gold. We can call it Faith in the Furnace. But we're going to focus on that last reason for suffering, and that is God-induced suffering. And let's start with this first verse, 1 Peter 4.12. And we'll put that on the screen for you. Uh, Peter said this, he said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Peter said, don't think it's strange when you find yourself in the furnace, when you find yourself in a fiery trial and you begin to say, woe is me and why is this happening to me? This never happens to anybody else. Why is God doing this to me? But Peter said, don't think it's strange. And uh, don't, don't think that that something is happening that is, that is strange and just happening to you because it happens to all of us. The, the furnace, the refiner's fire, the fiery trial, which refer to all those in Scripture, uh, is a trial or a test sent from God to make you and I more like Christ. He, uh, we have said before that, that everyone here today, you're in one of three places. You're either... Uh, getting ready to go into a trial, you're in the midst of a trial, or you're coming out of a trial. And it's kind of a circle. 
And we're going to see it happens more than once. And there, there's reasons for that. And it was true of Job. Job, here at the end of chapter 3, Job is in the furnace. He's lost his wealth, his health, he's lost his family, he's lost his fortune. He's de desperately holding on to his faith in God. And he begins to have discussions with his three friends who have come, traveled a long way, come, sat down with him for seven days, didn't speak for seven days. And now they start a conversation. And it's from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 37. This is a long conversation between Job and his three friends. And even though their purpose was coming was to bring comfort to Job, they really began to bring accusations to Job that said, Job, this is happening to you because you have sin in your life. You need to confess it. And, and, and the conversation gets heated at times to the point that in Job chapter 16, Job says to his three friends, you guys are miserable comforters. Miserable. And uh, instead of helping feel better or making him feel better, he began to feel much worse. But as you go through those 30-some chapters, 33 chapters, uh, there are some remarkable statements that Job made. And I call them nuggets. And you have to get in those 33 chapters and, and you have to read through all those conversations and you have to dig out uh, some of these nuggets that are there. But it's a remarkable thing. I told you a couple weeks ago, the book of Job, most Bible scholars agree that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. So Job didn't have the Bible to turn to to come up with these things that he said. There's only one way Job could know what he knew in these statements that he made, and that is what God, by his Spirit, revealed it to Job. Job is going to talk about things that didn't happen until thousands of years later. That didn't happen until Jesus came and was born. But Job is already saying things that's going to happen years later. And uh, th these are amazing statements that, uh, that he said. And the first one is in uh, Job chapter 9, verse 2. And uh, Job is answering one of his friends, and he says, Truly, and I know it is so. But then he asks the question, How can a man be righteous before God? How can a man be righteous before God? What did Job mean? Job knew, first of all, that he was what? Unrighteous. He knew that he was a sinner. And he knew because he was a sinner, he could not go into the presence of a holy and righteous God because God can't look upon sin. So Job, he, he's telling his friends, I would really like to talk to God. I need to understand why God is doing this to me. And at one point he even says, I want to take God to court. And I want to get this settled in a court. But then he asks this question. Yeah, I want to talk to God, but how can a man become righteous before a righteous God? Job said, I need to talk to God, but I'm a sinful man. I'm an unrighteous man. And I can't talk to God because I can't go into his presence. Then later, in that same chapter, we, uh, we find another nugget. In Job chapter 9, verse 32 and 33. Now, I got me a couple volunteers this morning, Luke and Levi. Luke and Levi, come on up here. These guys don't know what they're getting themselves into, but I told them, I promised them they wouldn't have to say anything. So that convinced them that they're here. So Levi, come right over here. Stand on this side of me over here. And, and look at your brother Luke. Don't make faces at him now, just look at him. And then Luke's in the right spot already. So let's pretend for a moment that one of these two uh, is God. Luke being the tallest, God's the biggest. So here's God, and here's Job. But Job knows he has a problem, right? He can't be in the presence of God because God can't look upon sin. You remember Adam and Eve in the garden once they sinned? What did they do? God came by and they what? They hid from God. Right? So Levi's going to turn around because he can't look at God. 
And God's going to turn around because he can't look upon sin. So now Job's got a real problem, right? He's what? He's lost fellowship with God. And, and he's saying, how can, a, how can a sinful man come into the presence of a righteous God? And yet Job is saying, I need to talk to God. Well, look at these two verses. You can't just hold your ground. Stand right where you're at. Job 9, 32 and 33. Listen to what Job said. For he is not a what? He's not a man as I am. He's not like me. That I may answer him and that we should go to court together. God is not a man, Job said. And I can't, I can't be in his presence. We can't talk this thing out. I can't take him to court. And, and then look what he said in verse 33. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. And Job is saying, I need quiet. I can't talk to God. I can't be in his presence. Therefore, I need a mediator. And what's a mediator do? A mediator kind of works between both parties to bring them back together again, right? And he said, I need a mediator who can what? Who can lay one hand on God and also lay one hand on me, man, and bring us back together. Now, folks, there's only one person, there's only one man in all of eternity that ever could or ever will be able to be in the presence of God, perfect, sinless, and at the same time, he was a man for 33 years. He said he knows how we feel. He knows all our infirmities. He knows all of our temptations. So he knows what it's like to be a man. He can touch a man because he became man. And at the same time, he's God. And he can touch God and be in the presence of God. As a matter of fact, first Jesus said right now. He's in the presence of the Father. For he ever liveth to do what? To make intercession. To be our mediator for you and me. And Job said, I need a, I need a man who can be in the presence of God. I need a man who knows what it's like to be a man and then you have to turn around come a little bit closer with Jesus as your mediator Job has a way to come into the presence of God you and I have a way to come into the presence of God and that's through the man the mediator Christ Jesus and all those people say it Amen. Amen. give these guys a hand thanks guys Isn't it amazing that Job knew that and wrote that before he had a Bible to turn to? Uh, I, need a, I need a mediator who can lay his hands on his foot. Then in the New Testament, in the book of 1 Timothy 2 5, we won't have it on the screen, but Timothy wrote this. He said, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So the person that Job was crying out and said he needed came in the person of Christ Jesus and then Timothy told us in, in the book of 1 Timothy that that person, that mediator between us and God is the man, Christ Jesus. Look at another nugget from Job. Job chapter 13, verse 15. Job, Job is just crying out. You know, you remember Job is miserable. He's sitting in an ash heap. He's got walls on his head down to the bottom of his feet. He's absolutely miserable. He's lost everything, but yet, and, and, and he wants to talk to God and reason with God, and he wants to sue God, and, and he's having all these thoughts and not getting much help from his friends. But in chapter 13, verse 15, look what he says. Speaking about God, he said, No, he what? No, he slayed me. No, he killed me. No, I die right here on this ash heap. I yet I will what? Trust him. I'm going to trust him even if he takes my life, Job said. When I, uh, some years ago now, I found myself in the, that furnace of affliction and I was battling stage four colon cancer and every morning I'd meet with God and pray and recite verses and, and, and cry out and plead with God. I would always end my prayer every morning with that statement from Job. Lord, though you slay me, though this cancer kills me, my, my goal is to trust you. Is to trust you whether it end good or whether it end bad. Lord, uh, I'm going to trust you. And then look at Job chapter 14. 
verses 14 and 15. Again, Job's going to ask a question that man is still asking today. Job 14, 14. If a man dies, shall he live again? That is still debated today, is it not? And some people believe when you die, it's all over. And then you and I believe when we die, it's just the start. It's just beginning. The good, the, the best is yet to come for you and I. But Job, Job said, if a man dies, will he live again? And then he said this. All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. Now, what did he mean, till my change comes? Well, Job believed that, uh, that he would live again after he dies. As a matter of fact, he would be changed into a more perfect body. He would be able to go in the presence of God, and he would be there for all eternity. He said to God, he said, you shall call, and I will what? I will answer you when, uh, when we die. And uh, today, you know, cremation is a popular thing. And many people are cremated and some still being buried. But however you, you're, whatever they do with your body, when you die, one day, that body's going to come out of the grave, come out of the urn, come out of wherever it was scattered, the ashes scattered. And God's going to call us up. And uh, Job said, my change is going to come. And God's going to call. And I'm going to answer. So that age old question. If a man dies, shall he live again? Job answered that for us in the book of Job. And then in chapter 19, verse 25 and 26, he's going to talk about his Redeemer, his Mediator. He's going to talk about Jesus who won't even come for thousands of more years when, from the time that Job wrote this. But he said what? For I know that my Redeemer lives. Yeah, they crucified him on the cross. But three days later, he raised from the dead, right? And Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And, and, and he will watch. He shall stand at last on the earth. Jesus came to earth. He lived as a man. He lived a perfect life. He died in your place and my place. He died the sinner's death. He was resurrected. And, and then he ascended back up into heaven. But he's going to do what? He's going to come back. And Job knew that. Job said he shall stand at last, meaning the last days, he will stand at last on the earth. Mine and your greatest hope is the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Amen? Amen. And he's coming back not to take sides. He's coming back to take over. And it, he's going to, this world is going to operate as he intended for it to operate when he comes back and rules and reigns on this earth. And listen to what Job said in verse 26. He said, after my skin is destroyed, he said, you can take my body, you can bury it, and my old body will decay, and the worms will eat it, and it will be destroyed except for the bones. He said, after my skin is destroyed, this I know. He didn't say, I hope this is what happened, or I think this may happen. He said, I know what's going to happen, that what? In my flesh, I will see God. So he said, bury my body. It's going to rot. It's going to decay. But here's what I know. When Jesus comes back to this earth, my body is going to resurrect and it's going to be, I'm going to be back in my flesh and in my flesh, he said, I will see God. Isn't that an amazing statement? Job is making that. Then all these statements before he ever has a Bible to read about these things. He's expressing his faith in God right in the midst of of the fiery trial or the furnace. Let's look at Job, another another amazing verse. Job 23, verse 10. Job says, but he, capital A, speaking of God, but he knows the way I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Job said he knows exactly. He knows my every move. He knows every step that I take. And uh, after he has put me in the furnace a number of times, maybe to test me and to try me and to purify me, Job said, I know the end result is this, that I'm going to come out pure like pure gold. It's an amazing thing that he would know that. So Job is giving us a picture of himself uh, expressing his faith in God and while he's in the midst of the fiery trial. And if you don't need that verse this morning, uh, you keep it handy, you hold on to it because you will find yourself in time 
that you will need to read that verse. Psalm 1, 6, I don't have it on the screen, but it says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And sometimes when we find ourselves in one of these tests or trials, and, 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 and the, the heat's turned up in the furnace, and, 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 and we're going through a time of suffering, we, uh, we sometimes wonder, where's God in this? Where's God? I don't feel God. God's abandoned me. But let me tell you something. Job thought the same thing. If we took the time to read in Job 23, 8, Job said, I go forward and he's not there. He said, I go backward, but I cannot perceive him. He said, I go to the left and I can't see him. I can't find him. I go to the right and I can't perceive him. Job could not find God, but he, he was following his feelings rather than his faith when he would have said it. I don't feel God's presence. And just because we don't feel his presence does not mean that he's not there. We may not know where God's at, but let me say something. He always knows. He always knows where I am and where you are. We don't know what the next day will bring. I don't know what he knows. Abigail, reading one of her books the other day, shared with me a little saying that was in it. And, and it goes like this, speaking of God. He's over it all, he's in it all, and he loves you through it all. And you can count on that. God's over everything, he's in it, he's close by, and he will love you through it. And you can bet your life when you when you find yourself in the refiner's fire, in the furnace, in the fiery trial, God is right there keeping his eyes on you. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me talk to you <clears throat> about two types of fire in Scripture. And the first one's the one we've been talking about, and it's the refiner's fire. The refiner's fire. It, it's, and, and the purpose of a refiner's fire is to make an object pure and strong and useful. That fire has a positive effect. That fire is a, what we can call a controlled burn. Uh, that, that fire is for the good. Uh, it's called a refiner's fire. And uh, there's, but there's another fire in Scripture, and, and it's called the consuming fire. And a consuming fire is a fire that destroys. It, it's a fire that inflicts hurt and pain and death. It's an all-consuming fire. And we're going to kind of compare the two the refining fire versus the consuming fire. Let's look at the refiner's fire first. Proverbs 17, 3. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace is for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. So the refiner's fire, that pot that he would put the, the gold or the silver in and heat it up, he said the refiner's pot is for silver and the furnace is for gold. But the Lord isn't looking for gold and silver. The Lord tests the what? The heart. And that's why you and I find ourselves in the furnace. Not that we're gold or silver, but he wants to refine us. He wants to purify us. He wants to strengthen us. He wants to make us like Jesus. And he uses refiner's fire to do that. That's what a time of testing is for. These fiery trials that test us. Look at Isaiah 48.10. Behold, I have refined you, God says, but not as silver, but I have tested you. Where? In the furnace of affliction. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. The refining process. There's a, there's a great demand today for silver and for gold. And, and to get it, uh, they're, they're always wanting to buy it. You see these ads for if you have rings or jewelry or anything with with gold or silver in it, they want to buy it from you. And what are they going to do with it? Well, they're going to put it in the pot. They're going to melt it down. They're going to turn it into pure gold or, or, or pure silver. So there's a large demand for it today. And if we look at the steps from biblical days of the refining process, a, a, a refiner, a, a, a silversmith or a goldsmith, they would take several pieces of ore and, and they would place them on a hard surface like an anvil. And then with a large hammer, they would break that into pieces. And I think many times 
God kind of breaks us into pieces that, that, that he might begin to purify us, to, to get the junk out. And then he would take those smaller pieces after he had broken it up, and he would place it in a pan, and then he would take water and pour it over the ore, and by doing that, he would wash off all the dirt and the decay. And, and then, then he'd take that remaining ore after it was broken up and as many impurities as possible removed, and after it was cleaned and the dirt and stuff washed off of it, he would put it in a cauldron in a pot. And he would place that pot on a hot fire. And, and the ore, the gold and the silver, would begin to melt. And because the gold and silver was heavier than everything else there, the gold and silver would go to the bottom of the pot. And the impurities would begin to rise to the top. And he would take a special tool, a skimmer, and he would skim those impurities off the top. And he would do it over and over and over again. He would skim off all the impurities that had risen to the top, keep it on the heat, and then a little bit more impurities would rise up. And he would skim those off. And a little bit more would rise up. Kind of like sin in your life and mine, right? We, uh, we, we confess it. We ask God to forgive us of it. But boy, they just they, they keep rising their head and, and coming back up to the top. And, uh, and God wants to refine us and remove it. And he would keep doing that process over and over and over again until he had the finished product, which is pure gold or sterling silver. But to do it, he had to do it at the just right temperature. It, uh, it could not be too hot. If it was too, the fire was too hot, it would damage the ore. If it was too cold, he couldn't get out all the impurities if it remained impure. One book said to do that to silver, you needed the fire to get somewhere between 1,600 and 1,700 degrees. To purify gold, you needed to get it to 1,945 degrees. So when you're in the fiery trial, I believe God, and I told you this last time, I think, God has one hand on the thermostat and he's got one hand on the timer. He won't let it get too hot or too cold and he won't keep you in the fire too long. He will keep you in just the right amount of time to renew those impurities. And somebody else says, well, when, when does, it, when does it, the silversmith or the goldsmith know when the process is complete? And uh, someone said, when the refiner can look into the pot, the impurities are gone, and he can see his reflection in the liquid gold. When he can see his face in the gold, then he removes it from the fire because the impurities are gone. And now it's pure. And that's God's intent for us. God will put you and I in the fire and he will skim off those impurities and he will do it over and over again until the world can look at you and not see you, but see who? See Jesus. To see Jesus in you, that's his goal. That's what he wants you and I to become. That the impurities have been removed and now we are molded and we're shaped into something beautiful. The, 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 the goldsmith and the silversmith would take that, that, that gold block that would come out after it cooled or the silver and he would begin to mold it and shape it and make it into something beautiful and something useful. And, and that's what God wants to do in your situation. After you come out of the fire, God's intent for you is that you be more valuable, you be more useful, and you be stronger and pure. In, in 1989, there was a United Airlines flight that a passenger jet was traveling from Denver to Chicago. And at about an hour into the flight, there was an explosion in the rear of the plane. And at that point, the pilot lost all his hydraulics to, uh, to fly that plane and to land that plane. They were, all, the dis all the hydraulics were disabled. And the pilot had to attempt the crash landing. And in that crash landing, 111 passengers on that flight perished. And after a long investigation by the FAA, it, it was determined that a, a small fan blade had broken causing the explosion. 
And, and the reason that it broke, when they took that metal from that fan, fan blade and they tested it, it had not been properly refined. And it had some impurities that remained in it. And, and, and because of that, it was weakened. And it failed in, in the result of the failure of that small piece of metal was 111 people died. Listen, God is always at work refining us. And, and, and he refines us because he cares about us. And we, we seem to think when we're in the furnace of affliction, God, if you cared about me, you wouldn't have me here. He has you there because he does care about you. That's his purpose for having you there. And, and, and so he does it to make us like Jesus, but he also does it that you and I might learn to cry out to God. Psalm 34, 6, and it won't be on the screen, but it says, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. I think when we're in the furnace, we spend more time with God. We cry out to God. We say, God, it's you that I need. And crying out brings God, gets God's attention, and, 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 and God reacts to that. When we're in the furnace, it helps us get our priorities right. We uh, we find out that spending God, spending time with God every day, is is more important than I thought it was, and we, we get our priorities in order. But it also, as we talked about last, the last time, it uh, it makes us better comforters. If we've been through it, we're in a better position to comfort others. I read a story about a race at the. Uh, at the Special Olympics. The kids were lined up for the 100 yard dash. And, and the starting gun went off. And uh, off they went for the finish line. And about halfway down the track, one of the kids fell. And, uh, and the others saw him fall. And they were still moving toward the finish line, but they were looking back to check on their friend. And, they, and then they began to yell, Get up, get up. You gotta finish the race. Get up, come on. But then it was evident, he was crying, uh, he was embarrassed, and, and, and he just couldn't get up. And those special head kids in the race, they all stopped, and they turned around, and they went back to their friend, and they helped him up, and then with their arms around each other, they all walked to the finish line, and they all finished the race. And the moral of the story for you and I this morning is, you know, uh, the Bible talks about winning the race and, and to run like you want to win. But let me tell you something, we're not always in it to win. We are in it to get everyone across the finish line. And sometimes that means going back to work that's down. And that means to bring them comfort and come alongside and, and let them catch up with the group and then let's finish together. And, and, and lastly, he does it as I've said throughout, to conform you and I to the image of Christ. You see, God's goal is not to make you happy. God's goal is to make you holy and to make you like Jesus so you can come into the presence of a righteous God. That's a refined fire. But what about the consuming fire? Look at Deuteronomy 4.24. For the Lord your God is a what? He's a consuming fire. He's a jealous God. And then look at Hebrews 12, 29. For our God is a consuming fire. I uh, pulled two slides, two pictures off the internet. You remember the uh, the wildfires here in Texas some years ago? They had a wildfire close to you here, right? But in the, in, in the town of Bashkop to the west, they had a horrible wildfire. Let's look at that first picture. See that wildfire in the background? People are trying to get out of its way. That's a, that's a consuming fire. And scripture says our God is like a consuming fire. Look at the next picture. There again. Uh, wow. That fire is not like a refiner's fire. It's not controlled. It's a consuming fire. It will destroy everything in its path as that fire did. It inflicts pain. It inflicts eternal pain. It's all consuming. It destroys everything in its path. It's not controlled. And uh, there's a story told about 
a group of elite firefighters who would come and fight fires like that. And they were they were fighting in a mountain fire, and uh, as they were fighting that fire, right in, very close to the fire, of course, uh, the wind changed direction. And when the wind changed direction, the fire changed direction. And the fire became that become or begin to travel toward the firefighters. And of course they knew they had to get out of there. So with everything with all the power ended, they began to run and run. But you know, you're looking over your shoulder to see where the fire's at. And it was evident that the fire they, they weren't running fast enough that the fire was getting closer and closer to them. And finally, the man in charge said to his firefighters, he said, come over here in this field. And they got over there in the field and he said, now, start a fire right here. And they said, why would we do that? We'll burn up. He said, no, no. He said, start a fire right here where we're at. And, and they did and they burnt that whole field quickly. And, they, and, and after that field was burned, he told his men, he said, now come and let's get in the middle of that field. Because he said, the fire won't come where it's already been. And let me tell you, the consuming fire, the judgment of God, fell on Jesus at Calvary. And because Jesus took my judgment and my punishment, I don't have to worry about the consuming fire consuming me because the fire won't come where it's already been. And Jesus took my judgment and my fire at Calvary. Aren't you glad? That consuming fire is scary. But you and I doesn't have to be. As a matter of fact, Malachi chapter 4, that's the last book in the Old Testament. Just as God was closing the Old Testament in chapter 4, Here's what it says, Malachi 4, 1 and 2. He says, For behold, the day is coming, and it's burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubborn. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. That's a consuming fire, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. No evidence, nothing left. But look at verse 2. That's for you and I if we've made Jesus Lord of our lives. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calf. You didn't know the Bible called you a fat calf, did you? He said to the wicked, the consuming fire is coming, and they're going to burn up, completely be destroyed. But he said for you, if you put your faith and trust in Christ Jesus, he said, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to care for you like a farmer cares for that uh, stall fed calf. That's, uh, that's the best beef, right? Uh, that's the calf that's really taken care of. Giving the best, taking care of the best. And God said, your future is one of those two things. Uh, Believers face a refining fire. It's controlled. It's for our good. It's a fire that only burns up the impurities in our lives and makes us stronger and fit for service. Unbelievers face the consuming fire. Romans 8, 28, 29. You know it. It will be up on the screen. But it says that we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. All things, He said, work together for good. That includes the fiery trials. Because why? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. God's, again, he has already predetermined that you and I will become like Jesus, and he will use fiery trials to make us more like him along the way. I told you at the start, Suffering usually comes because of four different reasons. And one of those reasons was the choices that we made. And uh, we have a choice. We have a choice to surrender our lives to Jesus, to put our faith in his finished work at Calvary, his resurrection from the dead, 
has promised to come for us again. If you choose to invite Christ into your heart and you become his child, he has promised you that he will walk with you through this life and then he will take you home to heaven to be with him in the next life. If you choose not to accept Christ, uh, then your future includes that decision to buy. And uh, today, this church, if you're here today and you're lost, and everybody here today may be saved, and I'm afraid that's the case. But if you're here today and you're not saved, then I invite you to come and surrender your life to Christ today. Make that choice. And yes, I can tell you, he will put you in the furnace a few times as you walk with him. But it'll be controlled. It'll be for your good. And uh, he will begin to work on you to make you like Jesus and to use you in this life and prepare you for the life to come. But if you choose not to do that, you will face the consequences of it. Choices is good. But remember this. You make the choice that someone else will normally determine the consequences. And there will be great consequences to your choice as to what you do with Jesus. Make the right choice. He is your mediator between God and man. He can bring you back into a right relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Would you stand with me? Carl comes and prepares to lead us in a Song of invitation. Would you bow with me and let's pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We uh, we know that uh, those fiery trials are not pleasant. It's not something we look forward to. It's not something that we pray and ask for. But Lord, from your perspective as our loving Father, it's something you know is for our good. And Lord, uh, you're close to us when we're in the fire, just like you were with the three Hebrew children. Lord, you won't let the temperature get too high. And you won't let the time be too long. So, Lord, may we thank you for the trials because we know that it's for our good. And we know it prepares us for heaven. And makes us more like Jesus so people can look at our lives and say, I want what that person has. So, Lord, we thank you in the trials or for the trials. But, Lord, uh, we need you as we go through the trials. They are never pleasant as if it's not pleasant for you. Lord, uh, if there's any here today that don't know you as Lord and Savior, may they understand the choice to choose you, Lord, uh, is so much better than the choice not to. That will lead to that eternal fire one day. That is a horrible, horrible, horrible future for those who refuse you. So, Lord, now by your spirit, as we have just a moment of invitation, Lord, I pray that you'll draw hearts for salvation, that you'll draw hearts and Maybe just want to spend time with you, Lord. That you'll draw hearts. There may be those here that need to be comforted. And may you prompt people in the congregation to go and to stand beside a person that's hurting. And maybe not say anything. Just whisper a prayer to them. And Lord, by your spirit, would you move now in this service and draw people to a right relationship with you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people say it. Amen.